Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Unschooling Lifestyle. Today, I have a, I guess every guest is special, but Kristen and I have been working on this interview for, I don't know, is it a year? It might be a year. Yeah, it maybe about a year. a year. So, we, yeah, so we have Kristen Harling from the Belize World School Hub, which we attended earlier um, in uh, on January 2024. So, I did my reflections on that, but this interview, we're going to talk about her experience in Belize, how she got there, and then what has come out of her life there, you know, in Belize for, I think almost, you're going on 10 years, I think, right? Yes. Indeed. Oh my goodness. I love it. So welcome, Christine. How are you? Thank you. Thanks for having me. And I am doing great. Yeah. Enjoying, uh, enjoying some nice weather today. I really like that. Yes. yes. So let's get started. Tell me where you're from in the U.S. and then how, how you decided to move to Belize to say, I'm out of here. And when too. Right. So I am originally from South Carolina. Mm -hmm. And I uh, spent extensive amounts of time also in Indiana, Colorado, and North Carolina. But I had returned back to South Carolina, was also the last place that I lived before I moved down here. And I, I first discovered Belize, and I came down here in 1996 as a college student. I did a okay. semester abroad here uh, through the School for International Training, and I fell in love with, I mean, everything here. It was, I mean, this is, you know, college is when it is that time in your life where, you, you know, everything is just, and so I, you know, I, it, reflecting back in later years, I, I think that part of it was that it was a place where I was able to fall in love with myself. And I think that is a part of why it really hit me mm -hmm. so deeply because yes. I discovered a lot about who I am. I also, I was very blessed to have an incredible academic director who ensured that we had a full understanding of like big global impact issues, how um, financial entities and global politics affect life in the, you know, what is essentially the global South, even though technically it's not, but in effectively in the global South. And so it was very eye-opening. It was very exciting. It was very um, mind-expanding. And so I really just fell in love with it. I cried the day that I went back. I had been here for three and a half months. And on the day that I returned, I, I cried multiple times. And I was not ready to go back. <laughs> and so... Oh, wow. Yeah. And then the next... Uh, that was I was here for the spring semester for the dry season... And I went back to college. I had one more year of college than my senior year. And I cried again when I went back to campus because the other bit was that this was a very much an experiential learning program, right? So mm -hmm. we were going, camping. We camped for like two months, um, which is wild to me now at almost 50. The thought of camping in Belize for two straight months is but yeah, Indiana. honestly, that sounds a little, that sounds very intimidating for me as well, you know, so. Over the top. Yeah, it was. So anyway, I, that's sort of how I discovered Belize. I came back here several times. I actually tried to move back here after I graduated from college. And that's a whole other story that. It wasn't the quite time. Exactly. It didn't go quite correctly. Um, so that's when I ended up back in Colorado uh, and I had my first two children and then moved back to the East Coast, lived in North Carolina for a while, moved back to South Carolina, had the second two children. And at that point, Lulu was born in 2013. And so uh, in 2014, I was not, I was not doing super well. I was mm -hmm. uh, almost 40 and had two. Wow. And, uh, yeah. It was, it was tough. And we just, a lot of it was my oldest and I sitting down and really talking about, and he had at that point been down here several times okay. and rain had also been down here several times. And so we just made the decision that I was running a cloth diaper service and we made the decision that I was going to 
sell the business, sell the car, sell the house, and move down here. And yeah. so we moved down here and we made a we made up a big business plan for what we wanted to do here. And then we moved down in March of 2015. So it's just been a little over nine years that we've been down here full time. Wow. Now, before we go on, like, talk to me because you and I have, so um, for a little bit of background, um, Kristen and I connected through the World Schooling, you know, Facebook groups, and then connected further over self-directed education, schooling, but her background in it, it's also very important and very crucial to the way the World School Hub is run right now, because that is one of the reasons why, um, you know, why we decided to invest our time, um, our resources into making it happen for our family because it really aligned with the values that we have. So right. would you share with us a little bit about that, about that, um, you know, experience that you have within the self-directed education movement? Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's definitely a crucial component of what we do here. And mm -hmm. I, you know, like I said, my experience, my semester here was, was very experiential. Um, I mean, there were still academic components to it, but it was like nothing that I had ever yeah. experienced before. And yet I learned more in that three months. And I knew that I knew that I had learned more in that three months than all the rest of it put together. And yeah. so, um, that was in 96 and then Ruben was born in 98 and I, I, I really, you know, going into, I knew that I wanted to have a child. I was ready to have my first child. I was still young. I was 23. I was a baby, but I was ready. I knew what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to be a mom. And then as soon as he was born, I said, I took one look and I said, that's it. This is my life. This is what I'm doing. I am focused on this being right here. Yeah. And so I, I knew that that was going to be the center of whatever. Um, whatever I was going to do, I don't really know that I had made any kind of real decisions about education. Um, I think if you had asked me before he was born, you know, I, yeah, I would have said that we were just going to find something cool or whatever, but I, I, I had no intention of staying home until he was born. Yes. Um, yeah. So anyway, we, I got deeply involved in La Leche League and there were a number of people in La Leche League. La Leche League is like a little radicalization corner. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting though, because, you know, Dana Martin, who I took, um, I did my, one of my first um, advocacy and mentorship program into unschooling, started, herself started at La Leche League too. You know, she was, uh, she was a mentor, yeah. you know, so it's interesting you mentioned La Leche League though. That's, that's amazing. Yeah. I was having, I was having a home birth partly because of what I had seen with birthing down here. Mm -hmm. And, um, so I was having a home birth and the midwife required us, you know, she said that was one of the requirements of home birth was that you go to a law meeting and I was living in Colorado and I knew no one other than my in-laws. Um, it was not a great experience. Uh, so I needed friends anyway, I need, as a new mom, I needed community. And so this yeah. is where I first began to sort of get exposed to all these different ideas and education that you're just, you're not aware of unless you're in that world. And yes. so this is where I learned about unschooling. This was my first exposure to Sudbury schools, uh, Alpine yeah. Valley, um, mm -hmm. just north of Denver had just opened up right around the time that Ruben was born. And so I was hearing little whispers about what, you know, oh, Alpine Valley is so weird. What are they doing over there? And so I just kind of was keeping my options open. And I, I eventually sort of came to the conclusion that I would basically homeschool. You know, I, was, I wasn't really at a place where I was able to accept unschooling, really, at that time. Yes, yes. I mean, that's a journey for sure. Yes. <laughs> It is. I mean, we had, I had all kinds of like screen restrictions. Girl, I didn't own a plastic toy. You know, I, I was wild. I was, I was all the way hippied up. And uh, <laughs> anyway, we, when we moved back to the East coast, you know, Ruben is a, is a very incredible, 
incredibly, he's still very social. And as a small child, it was just constant. And I'm, I'm a bit of a homebody, you know? And it was every day. It was like, mommy, mommy, go to the park, mommy, go to the park. Can I have a play date? Can I have a sleepover? I mean, just all the time. And oh, I can totally he started, relate. other people got in his ears and he started hassling me about school. He was like, I really want to go to school. I want to go to school. And I was like, and at that point I had sort of started to come around to unschooling. I, you know, we were still doing a fair amount of screen limits and all kinds of weird food things, but Mm-hmm. Um, but we had, I was, I was moving in that direction and I was like, all right, well, if I'm going to let you decide and you want to go to school, then I'm going to let you go to school. So he did one year of charter school and he hated it and I hated it more. Mm. And so, um, yeah, they had circle time at the beginning where all the little kids had to sit in a circle and sing yes. songs and he came home and he was like, what is that? That is so dumb (laughs) yeah Ruben wasn't having circle time and so uh so I had found a group of people who were talking about starting a Sudbury school so I got involved with that I helped found Mm -hmm. the Katua Sudbury school in Asheville we opened in 2000 so Ruben was seven and uh Rain was yeah 2005 Rain was three so I took Rain with me I was a full-time staff Okay. Uh, well, I started out part time, I guess, but it pretty quickly I went to full time, and a lot of the original founding people sort of drifted away, and I, it ended where I was pretty centrally carrying the motion of it. You know, I mean, obviously mm-hmm. it's a democratically run institution, but our you know our students leaned heavily in the younger direction, so I didn't have a lot of teenagers helping with a lot of that administrative kind of stuff marketing okay. that kind of thing. yeah that's so, yeah so all of that was that ended up uh, largely mine and i did that for five years wow and at that point i made the decision i mean i was working 50 60 hours a week there for and there was mm-hmm. no pay and you know i still had I still had bills, <laughs> so yeah, they don't go I was away. trying to, you know, maneuver other things and trying to make things happen, uh, but it was definitely taking a toll. And, yeah. but I will say that it is an incredible experience there. And I, in the process of running that school, I also went to Sudbury Valley in Massachusetts, the original one twice, maybe three times. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Three times. And that is, it's just extraordinary. There is, there is no other, I've been in all kinds of university campuses. There is no other intellectual and not just intellectual, but just vibrant, creative, alive. There's no other community like that. It was amazing to see a group of kids be free together and be interacting and playing and honestly like this is a lot of this is why i started the hub here is because i wanted my kids to have the younger ones who never they weren't alive yet um Mm -hmm. and i wanted them to have that experience but i knew i couldn't and by first of all i had sworn to myself that i would never start another school again but also it just wouldn't fly here. The culture is, it, it's just, it wouldn't, there wouldn't be sufficient numbers of students to- Okay, to make it work. It. Yes, okay. Yeah, so we had, we closed in 2010. I had decided I was gonna, at that point I was gonna move down here and that time it just didn't work out. And so that's when I ended up moving down to South Carolina. But, and then after that, you know, we unschooled, the kids did a couple of years in public school. We, you know, we've done all the things. Yeah. Um, So my journey has definitely been all over the place, but Sudbury is definitely where my heart is. And and unschooling is really as close to that as I can get that I enjoy Sudbury more is just the community aspect, just, just the way that, that, yeah, the way that kids interact with each other and play off of each other and they bring different interests and different skill sets and and that free flow of of creative juice is 
it's a joy. Yeah. That sounds so amazing though. What makes you move, decide, okay, this is it, we're moving back. We're going to do a second time and we're, you know, we're selling everything. What happens there? Right. So, well, we moved down in 2015 and mm -hmm. we had, we had made a business plan, but it, it, we, we had a business plan set up where essentially what I wanted, again, this, this all, <laughs> this all comes from this desire I have for my kids to have this experience. So essentially what it was would be um, a resort that was very family and play focused. Okay, so okay, okay. I, I had gotten really deep into, uh, for a time, into the play movement. Into the, yes. Yeah. And this is where, for adults and for children, this is where magic mm -hmm. happens. Play yes. is, you know, play is anything where you lose time, anything, and if it's, cooking or it's art or whatever it is, if there's anything where you, where the hours pass and you miss that, though that's play. And I firmly believe that when people play with each other, that they can reform bonds again. Life mm -hmm. is difficult. The world is mad stressful right now. I mean, and all the time, but right now just mad stressful. And so play gives us the opportunity to reconnect with each other. It gives yes. us the opportunity, opportunity to reconnect with our children, to remember who you are yourself, to remember who your kids are, who your spouse is. And, oh, I remember you. I like you. I totally forgot that I liked you. That's nice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that was the idea was that it would be a resort that would be very play focused where we'd have, you know, books and movies and that kind of stuff, but also like a trampoline on the water and, um, you know, ways for families to engage with each other and also allow for it to be a benefit to the greater community through uh, the kind of tours. So we ended up finding a piece of property in this small, tiny little uh, village called Monkey River Town. You didn't go with us to Monkey River Town, did you? No, we didn't go. So Monkey River Town is tiny, tiny, like 250 people tiny. Oh, wow. Um, that is very tiny. Yes, it's very tiny, but it's extraordinarily beautiful. And um, so we lived there for like two and a half years. That situation just didn't pan out. It just okay. didn't. But there's a whole variety of reasons. It's a crazy long story. But it was a good experience. It's, it is truly one of the most beautiful places on the planet. I really love taking people there now. The community was a blessing to me in many ways. And so um, I enjoy taking groups of people down there now, taking some mm -hmm. love into that community. It was actually a huge town before the, the um, big banana blight. It was a town, like oh. one of the largest towns in Belize, like 6,000 people. That was huge banana farms. Wow. Anyway. That is, yeah. um, so, that, okay. That's how I, so this is the first time that I hear that story, but honestly, that sounds like an amazing concept. It might've been just ahead of its time in the moment, you know, I don't know, but it sounds like, um, it sounds like a, it sounds like a really great place to be. I often think that the whole world is really inaccessible to children and the ability to have free play overall. You know, I did a play worker um, workshop and went to New York, to the yard in New York. I don't know if you've heard about it F freely, like truly being just, you know, playing and being supportive. And just, it really changes you when you, as an adult, when I, fe I felt how conditioned I was to not do stuff because I was worried what other people would think or how other people would see me, you know. So it was, it was a really interesting um, dynamic for me to go through as an adult and realizing how much I need play, you know, if not more than, you know, my children in this particular moment, you know, in their ages. So, yeah. Yeah. No, kids, kids know how to play. It's no problem for them. Um, yes. Yeah, it is. It is more difficult for adults. I, I do think I, I continue to think it was um, an incredible idea and really yes. our limitation was just, was just money. Honestly, like we were trying to, crowdfund and raise up funds to make it happen. And I thought, oh, people will totally go for this because it's brilliant. <laughs> all, of our, all of our ideas are brilliant. Oh man, all, I hope it happens. Ones. Yes, I hope it happens at some yeah. point though. But I mean, aside yeah, I don't know if at this point, at this point, I don't know that I want to be in the- Did you want to I mean, do it's, it? It's, 
still it's still tourism that's still tourism business and i and i don't know that I, that that's the business i i enjoy being with kids and and with families but like the the day-to-day -day of um operational yeah yeah i had a i have a good friend here who who said who moved here a few years before i did and he said i want to write a book for people who want to move here that's just called your idea sucks <laughs> because all of us do it you move down and you have this and that is i I see it all the time. I'm on all of these. Do you really? Whatever. I see all the time. I see people with these and I did it. I did it. I can't, I can't talk trash about it because I did the same thing. You have this idea of what you want to do in a different country. And that's madness. It's madness because you can't know until you get there. Yeah. You can't yeah. know what you don't really know what you can do even until you are there. Um, but you also don't really know what needs to be done, what you want to do, you know, how you can be, especially like coming from, you know, being from the United States and moving to Central America. Yes. You know, uh, yeah, that's I, a huge. There's a lot of like tricky uh, colonialist <laughs> pitfalls that you, that you've yeah. got to you put some effort into avoiding. Um, I mean, and it never ceases to be problematic, but you know, this is, we do our best. We do our best to, to be a gift to the community in the best way that, you know, in the best way that you know how. Yes. And I really love, because that's kind of how I felt, um, you know, when we went there to the hub. So, you know, for if for those of you that don't know, I was born in Mexico, but I have been living in Michigan for about 20 years now. And I work as a flight attendant. And one of my least favorite routes to do is the flight from Detroit to Cancun. And the reason why I don't like going there, it's because I take a lot of people that are on first time vacation, in a couple of years so it's like it's it's a, it's, it's this very like pen energy of going there and just doing whatever they want to do without taking in consideration the the country the people that live there and the people that serve them and then how the hotel area like if you think of cancun the hotel area it's completely isolated from the rest of the city. Yeah. I mean, the people that work at the hotels have to get on a bus for like 45 minutes to an hour to get yeah, to the hotel. So it's a bus. very, yeah. And it's, and it's a very, um, and it's a very um, closed up um, environment where they don't want you to leave that area. You know, like the hotel itself is that they just want you to be there. Um, so yeah. I don't really, yeah. you know, so being from Mexico, I have seen that culture where they go in there and try to take, you know, um, change, you know, as if they knew better than the people that live there. That is a, yeah. it is a constant, constant fight here. And I don't know if you know, but it, this is this exact same thing is going on in Jamaica right now. I've been reading about it recently, um, about locals not having access to the beaches, which is. Yes. Quite, with the cruise lines. Mm -hmm. Here, this is here you don't that is that's absolutely not allowed here and that i'm really grateful there is a number of things that were set into place a long time ago and some that have come to pass over the years and then other like more cultural traditions but the it's called because belize was british commonwealth uh, or mm -hmm. is british commonwealth um and so it's called the queen's land uh, the first like i don't know how many feet but there's a certain number of feet from the high tide mark that that is government property and you cannot own it and you cannot block people from it. And that includes peers. You can't own a peer. You can build a peer, but you can't keep people off of it during the day. You can restrict access at night um, for safety okay. reasons, but you cannot, you can't say, and that really tripped me out because one of the first places we lived in Monkey River had a peer. And I would look out there during the day and there'd be these dudes sitting on the pier, throwing nets, catching bait fish or whatever. And I was like, bro, oh, what are you doing? And they were like, yeah, we're catching fish. But it's great because it prevents exactly that thing from happening. And so you just get put yeah. in place really quick. And that is, um, that is important. And then, you know, like Hopkins is an incredibly powerful community. Culturally, the Garifuna people, 
particularly in Hopkins, this is a very strong culture. And so there's a yeah. lot of effort to keep land in local yes. hands, to mm-hmm. keep the culture strong, but it doesn't stop the, the push, the push from immigrants. I don't do um, the term expat. I really don't like it, but immigrants from the U S here constantly there's whining is the word I'm going to use about music late. Um, even I've heard people complain about when someone dies here, there's, they, they drum, I mean, okay. for hours, usually the night yeah. before. And then for the funeral, they drum as they carry the body up from the church up to the cemetery. It's beautiful. Like it's extraordinary, but mm-hmm. somebody's going to whine about it. So. Somebody's going to go. Compl- there's always someone, you know, it reminded me of, um, I was coming back from Costa Rica one time and there was this, I had this passenger, this lady, um, she was, she was older, but she was saying, I'm like, well, I'm like, how's your trip? You know, we're like, um, we were in Liberia, Costa Rica. So it's like a very beachy, you know, it's a lot of beach, but it's really pretty. And she's like, Mm -hmm. it was terrible. She said there were sun and there were mosquitoes and it was hot and there was no air conditioning. And she's like, it was terrible. And I'm like, I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, did you know that this is Costa Rica, like, did you know, like, before you came here, like, you can't just come here and like, and, and, and not really, you know, take in for, you know, for what it is, right, for what they have to offer you. So, which is one of the reasons why I love the hub. And there are two pieces that I want to touch on here, because first is that um, your experience with your life in Belize made our hub experience a lot better you know, Mm. and it really made the difference for us because I didn't have to research all the stuff. And even though I do, I love research. Like I love finding, but once I, once I find someone that is trustworthy in their environment, and then I know that, that they are looking out for the best of their community, then I don't have to worry about, Mm -hmm. right? So that was one of the pieces for the, for the hub that kind of like, it made it easier for us to just say yes. And then the other piece was how open the hub was because there was, um, there was quite a few activities, but every activity was enjoyed by someone else. I think if you ask every single person, how did, how was it your, your, you know, your experience with, you know, they got cooking, you know, everybody will tell you something different. Because Mm -hmm. everyone got the opportunity to enjoy it how it was meant to be for them. And I really, really appreciated that. So I wonder, would you talk a a little bit about how you came up with this concept of the World School Hub and how you put it together? And then, uh, then of course, the, um, the ones that are coming up for people to join if they want to. Right. Well, I I started seeing, I, I found the World School community after I had moved to Belize, but not long after, and I was so delighted with the discovery. I got so excited um, with mm-hmm. the idea of world schooling. And so, and I guess, I don't know, a couple of years ago, I started seeing things about hubs and, and I just thought that would be a great idea. And again, we come back to, you know, me wanting for my kids to have, um, for my kids to have that experience of being with in community with other children. Yeah. Um, you know, from a similar, from a similar background, you know, from a similar kind of education type of background. Yeah. So I decided that I would start to put one together. I, I, I made the decision that this was a thing that I could do mm-hmm. that I could really, that I could handle, you know, that wouldn't be overwhelming, like starting a school. So, you know, a shorter experience. And then it's also not really, you know, it's not lodging tourism kind of thing. So it's not all of that kerfuffle. And I I thought, well, this is really kind of the perfect thing, right? Where I can bring kids down. I know what an incredibly magical place this is. I've I've been experiencing the, the magic that is Belize for almost 30 years. And yeah. I, I've watched 
the children experience all these. And the other thing was that it also gave us the opportunity to go and do some things that we've never been able to do here since we moved here. And Mm -hmm. so, uh, you know, like going up to the caves and it just gave, so it was really, uh, the more I thought about it, it was really a a no brainer. And, and I have the mind for logistical stuff. I just do, this is a skill that set that I have. I also know, like you said, it's important to me to that, that I have, it's helpful that I have such so much life experience here. And then I know who most of the guides are here that Mm -hmm. I know um, where, because when you, even when you research, like you don't always know, right. You can't always tell like what is website marketing and what is authentically a really good experience. Yeah. And so I feel like I, I knew that there would be no problem with me filling up the time. And in fact, when I originally set it up, I set it up with four days a week of activities okay. um, for a whole month. And I had no, and I mean to tell you, I had no problem filling that. I had no problem filling up four days a week for four weeks for four weeks. Yeah, that um, sounds like, that sounds unsustainable for for on my end. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Um, this year we had two days a week of like unschool co-op and that didn't really go off the way that I it just didn't it wasn't a workable thing. It didn't work right with the way that the community was going. And so okay. what I decided would would work better would be so this next January we'll have two days a week of activities and then one day a week of a family gathering where Mm -hmm. everyone in the family comes together and we just hang out where I don't have, you know, to organize transportation and the tours and the guides and all that stuff where we just come together and we just hang out. And so that is the, that's the plan. It's, it's going to just continue to be an evolving an evolving thing, but you know, I knew that this was going to be a, a great experience for kids. It and really I was. Also so. knowing that I, I'm so glad. I, I just also I have, you know, Ruben is 25 now, and so I've got 25 years of parenting experience. I've got all the flavors of neurodivergent in our house. You know, we have. I feel really well qualified to to take out a group of kids whether their parents come or not you know and some of the parents decided to come and some of the parents didn't and Mm -hmm. whatever the case I I feel like I have the logistical abilities to put it together and then I know the guides that are going to make sure that everyone has fun and I'm I'm working through explaining neurodivergence to our guides here (laughs) not a well okay. understood term here um but where we're working with it and for the most but Belizeans are so laid back and so it just isn't everybody's fine yes they're like oh, the kid needs to sit for a while okay whatever you know it's fine i it's really i mean honestly yeah we had a great experience though i mean you know i really enjoyed the you know like their experience, you know, Anthony's Anthony watch, you know, once we went fishing, he just watched the person, you know, like do the whole fish thing. And, and it was amazing that he said, you want to help? And he's, he's actually, he asked actually, can I, can I help? Can I do it? And he said, like, yeah, sure. Come on over here. And then when Ari was in the water, he wanted, he, we were in the snorkel and he's mm-hmm. like, He's like, just let me do my thing. And I'm like, we're in the middle of the ocean. Like, how can I just let you do your thing? But he took him, you know, he grabbed his little life vest and he just dragged him around. He didn't put his face in the water, you know, but there was no pressure to say, well, you should put your face in the water because there was a lot of, there was a lot of fish. So I I was trailing behind him with the, you know, grabbing the life vest too. So we both had a hand on him, but I kept my distance, which was essentially what he wanted from me. He was like, let me do my mm-hmm. thing. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to let you do it, your thing, but I also have to try to do my thing here, you know? So we mm-hmm. work it out, but everybody's needs, everyone's needs were met at that point where he felt he had the autonomy, like he just went on his own. Right. But I was yeah. having a hard time with that. 
Uh, but he oh, yeah. took him. He just took him and he just, and he, yeah. it was just, yeah, it was just everyone. really, yeah, it was super laid back for, for everyone. People raise each other's children here and children have, this is one of the things that I really wanted for my kids in moving here is, you know, because I moved here ultimately because I wanted to be, to live here and I've always wanted to live here, but also I, I knew what a great place this is. Children have so much autonomy. Um, sometimes it's a little far, honestly, but I, it, I, they have, yeah, uh, you know, um, it's a personal, yeah. um, personal preference thing, I'm sure. Um, but kids have a lot of freedom to play and wander outside and the weather's always nice. I mean, unless it's rainy and it rarely rains yeah. all day. Yeah. So it's yeah. just. There's so much, and even if it's raining, it's not cold ever. So they just have so much freedom to be. I, you know, my kids have had, the two youngers have had unlimited electronics access their whole lives. And they'll spend, they've never, so we've never had those battles. And I know that that helps. I know that makes a huge difference, but they spend a ton of time outside and we're talking about two neurodivergent kids in different ways, neurodivergent. Um, and both of them, um, are great with, you know, knowing when they need to step away, knowing when they, as they say, when they need to touch grass, you know? Yes. And, and what a gift uh, it is, you know, to be able yeah. to have that. Yeah. 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 That is absolutely watch out for your children here you know like nobody's gonna uh, nobody nobody's gonna ignore that um a child who needs assistance yeah that's amazing though so when are the so i know you have two more hubs coming up can you share the dates and the length of them for us yes august i'm, I'm just gonna check this yes. i have so i have a two-week one coming up in august and this one is a little bit different for the one in August. I've got, I've got different activities for each day. And mm -hmm. so people can choose. So uh, essentially you're paying it's like a la carte. me. Yeah. It's yeah. You can just, you can pick and choose which activities you want. Essentially you're paying me to organize, to do the logistical organizing. So whichever there's a, it's like a menu, you know, you're like at a restaurant. And so there's a few things each day. Whichever one you choose, I will do the organizing of the transportation and any tour guides that are needed, whatever, that kind of stuff. But then the people participating will pay those guides directly. So obviously I'm not going to be, because I can't blame multiple places at once. Mm -hmm. So I will not be um, attending all of those things, <clears throat> although I will be available at all times and attending for some of them. And but then we'll also, we're also going to have a couple of like, family gathering where everyone will get together like dinner drumming kind of stuff cultural things so that one is august 4 to the 24th august the 4th to the 24th so that's just a two-week hub so um it's a minimal upfront cost just for organizing and the dinners and drumming and that kind of stuff and mm -hmm. then so then you can also decide like you can make not just what you want to do decisions, but also like financial decisions, you know, like uh, some tours are, are a lot more expensive than others. So if somebody wanted to come down and experience some things and then also just, and you can take days off, you know, there's just things available. So it's a sort of strewing of activities and you can choose what you want. And yeah. Then I have I... A, the next one is um, similar to what we did with y'all this january yes it's the month long one right be... what's up it's the one that month it's long. a month long yeah yeah so this one is a month long i started a little bit later i felt like we were a little too close to christmas last year okay so, <clears throat> this one starts on the 19th of january and goes to the 14th of february so the last thing that is offered is um, Valentine's Day babysitting at my house. So for parents who want to go out for Valentine's Day, we have some lovely restaurants here and uh, Rain and I will have a pile of children, you know, 
I love that. <laughs> Eating Valentine's <laughs> <laughs> I may take you up on that. That's so amazing, though. So those are the two hubs plan. But, you know, obviously, these are very specific dates. And, the you know, the tours have already kind of been like laid out and chosen. But I know you're also doing since you have, you know, have long term experience living in Belize now and you're getting to know the people that do the tours, you're also curating like individual experiences for people that are trying to come to Belize, right? Right. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm happy to sit down and chat with, it can be a group, a family. Um, so I know that there's some like world schooling groups that travel together. Yes. Um, so I'm happy to talk with people like that or other kinds of groups or just large families or even solo travelers. You know, I think that there's a lot of, there's a lot of value in how much experience I have here and understanding oh, yes. like, what is not only what is good, but also like what is safe. If you're, um, if you're LGBTQ plus, like what places are friendly to you, you know, what, what guides are best if you do have neurodivergent kids, um, you know, if you're a, a woman traveling alone, um, you know, what things are and aren't safe and what things do you need to keep your eyes out for? And so I'm happy to sit with any group or individual and, and get an idea of, you know, basically I get an idea of what they want, what their travel style is, what they're interested in. Do they want to yes. be busy? You want to go, go every day? Because some people really dig that, you know, some people, I need days, multiple days of this. Yes. Sit out. I do too. Though. Know? I do too. Any 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 trips longer than four days, we actually need a day to like not leave our accommodations wherever we are. Like we need a day to stay inside for sure. You know. But I love what you said about, and I really think this is important because you can read all the blogs, and everybody obviously a, a blog post has been reading from someone else's experience, from someone else's point of view. But yeah. when I was researching Belize, there was a lot of posts that were saying about women traveling alone. And I honestly, I honestly, when my husband was like before, because we had researched Belize before, you know, prior to mm -hmm. the hub. So when he would bring it up, I would be like, mm, no, what I've read so far is that it's just not a safe place for, for women to be alone. So I don't really want to do it, you know? And then mm -hmm. eventually we, you know, we came to know you and then we got to learn about Belize and it really made a, it made a big difference. And when I was there, at least in the area that we were, you know, it, mm -hmm. it didn't, I didn't, I never, I didn't feel unsafe you know, at all, but it really made it different that I knew someone there. So yeah. it's, you know, it really takes, you know, to speak to someone that has lived there, that has really experienced it beyond just your one time, you know, um, before a one time thing, it, it really, it could really make or break your trip, I think. Yeah, I, I think so too. I mean, just, just somebody who knows who knows, you know, some of the cool places to go that you may or may not, that yes. you may, or may not read about, or, um, yeah, I mean, the safety issue is, I mean, and it's, you know, I but can that's give everywhere insights too, you about, know. yeah, no, it certainly is, but I can give insights about culture, like here, men, especially when they've been drinking here, very, very forward. Hey, baby. I mean, I'm hollering wild. It's wild. And when you're from the U.S., you're, like, not used to that, right? Because no. Men, men had to stop. Men had to stop doing that uh, up there. But it's very common here. But for the most part, 99 times out of 100, they're harmless. They're just they're just making noise. That is intense. And at night, it drives my friends crazy crazy yeah i don't know it's okay though but um we'll finish up by saying so what is the best way to contact you so you're working so we have the two hubs and i'll recap because we had a technical issue here um so we have two hubs a two-week one in august a month-long one in january but also yeah. like she's like kristen said if you're if you're a world school group with several families she can help you plan your experience over here so what's the easiest way for people to contact you and also we'll have all of those um details on the show notes as well so right 
Um, so I am on, um, I can be reached on Messenger, at Kristen Harling is my Facebook, and I can also be reached on WhatsApp, uh, Belize runs on WhatsApp, Belize would die without WhatsApp. Yes. And <laughs> Mexico, same thing. Yes, totally. Yeah. Um, I also have a Discord um, my email is Kristen Harling at Gmail and I will, um, I'll send you like the link to my, to my WhatsApp so that, you okay. can, because that's the easiest way I find, I don't know what it is, but I don't know. Sometimes it, I have trouble with like different country codes. So I just send people the, Oh, the one for you so they can find you instead of you finding them. Yeah. I know there's many different codes though. So, you know, yeah. So but we definitely will put all those links for you out there, you know, for it. But for anyone that's interesting, do reach out. Honestly, it was probably one of, the, you know, um, it was our first hub that we, that we went to, but making the connection with Kristen and knowing that she had experience from the country really made our decision easier because I had talked to several people of, I've been wanting to join a hub for quite a while now, you know, mm -hmm. and it just, I mean, for one way or another, it didn't pan out. Right. But right. Um, we had a great time. So we're hoping to go back. Uh, we're still, it's hard for us to commit like that far in advance, but it, we wow. are hoping to go back. Um, but everyone, um, thank you so much for listening to us. So I hope this was helpful so you guys can visit Belize and utilize Kristen's extensive knowledge about the area and um, and how, to, how you can best utilize your time. I mean, that's just really amazing, though. So thank you, Kristen, for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you, too, love. It was good to talk to you again. It was so good to talk to you. And for everyone out, out there, please remember that your time is precious. I hope you're making it count. See you later. Thank you. Bye-bye.